New Orleans Saints cornerback Marshawn Lattimore and his contract are catching a lot of eyes all of a sudden, and it's opening things up to a lot of misinterpretation. So let's get the record clear here and help you understand why Marshawn Lattimore's contract doesn't need to be traded thanks to one genius clause. We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? I am your host, Ross Jackson, New Orleans native, your New Orleans Saints expert, credential member of the media covering those New Orleans Saints as a senior writer and reporter over at Saints News Network. And on today's episode of Locked On Saints, I'm going to update you on all the Saints Biggest and most notable combine conversations. We'll break all that down. We're also going to take a look at why possession-wide receiver is kind of crawling up the boards for the New Orleans Saints. It's a big-time need going into this offseason. And to kick us all off, Marshall Lattimore's contract is getting a lot of attention. So let's get the record straight on what it actually means for the Saints and a potential trade. We got all that coming up for you today. We appreciate you very much for being an everydayer here on the Locked on Saints podcast and, of course, for checking us out and making us your first listen of the day every day here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked On Saints is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. Make every moment more, and it's even easier to do so now because new customers will get $150 in bonus bets by winning any $5 bet. Head over to FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started today. Marshawn Lattimore's new contract, which was restructured and kind of reworked before the end of the 2023 season, does not need to be traded. The New Orleans Saints are not in a situation in which they have to move on from Marshawn Lattimore. That circumstance does not exist. We're going to break down Marshawn Lattimore's contract thanks to the great detail that Jason over at Over the Cap went through. You can go and check him out over at Jason underscore OTC on your favorite social media, but there's one specific clause, as much as he kind of swings and misses on potential draft compensation and things like that, which we'll also cover, there's one specific clause that makes it so that the New Orleans Saints are not in the situation that it feels like a lot of people external to the Saints beat feel that the Saints like have to move on from Marshawn Lattimore. That's just not the case. So let me tell you what that clause is right away. So the clause is simple, that if the Saints So what the Saints did was that they took Marshall Lattimore's $15 million base salary and then they reduced it all the way down to veteran minimum. Instead of them taking that reduction amount, which was just over $13 million, and turning it into a signing bonus like they would do in any usual or typical restructure, they instead set it as an option bonus that they have to pick up one way or another, it's going to get back on the books. Like there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It doesn't just disappear anywhere. That's one of those misconceptions that we'll highlight in a little bit. Uh, But so a week before the season begins is the deadline for that option bonus. There's a deadline to sort of get the deal done if they do want to do a trade, which I still think would be a bad idea. But then the other piece of it is that if the Saints allow that option bonus to set in, it automatically prorates. That's the clause that saves them from, you know, taking on a $15 million cap hit. Like they're not going to put themselves in a situation where they have an option bonus that's sitting there a week before the NFL season begins, you know, to only to get to that point and go, oh no, now there's a $15 million cap hit that we have to figure out how to absorb. That's not going to happen. It would automatically prorate over the course of five years, according to uh, Jason over at Over the Cap's breakdown of the contract terms. That's great news if you're a Saints fan that doesn't want to see Marshawn Lattimore moved on from, because what that means is that the Saints have a bunch of time to figure things out, uh, probably before training camp, if they want to move on from them. So after June 1st, but before training camp is kind of the hot zone for this potential trade to take place. But if it doesn't, they don't fall into a situation where all of a sudden 13 plus million dollars slaps onto the books and they got to figure out how to deal with that in 2024. It's going to automatically prorate. So it's going to give them the opportunity to still stay below the salary cap, keep his you know, cap hit low for 2023 or 2024 and all that. And then it pushes money into future years like they would have done with a common or standard restructure anyway. So that's the clause that makes it so that the Saints aren't in a situation to where for salary cap purposes, they have 
to move on from Marshawn Lattimore. And I think Nick Underhill over at New Orleans South Football has done a really good job of reminding people of this. If the Saints move on from Marshawn Lattimore, it's not for cap saving measures. It's not for cap purposes. It's because of whatever the sort of turmoil is that's apparently been happening in the midst of all that. And turmoil is probably not the right uh, word to use. It's probably more of a disagreement. But we've seen team, we've seen this team and a player where wherever there's a little bit of a disconnect, be able to find a way to bridge that gap before. I wouldn't be surprised to see them do it here again with Marshawn Lattimore. So why is it that the um June 1, post June 1 to the beginning of training camp area is sort of the hot zone for a trade for Marshawn Lattimore? Because even though this trade isn't happening for cap purposes, there are some nifty things you can do to help yourself cap wise in making the trade. If you trade him before June 1st, you end up taking on a lot of dead money, all this other stuff right away. If you wait until after June 1st, some of that stuff defers to future years. So that's why the post June 1st, so after June 1 makes a lot of sense. You're not trading for 2023 draft, 2024 draft capital. You're probably trading for 2025 draft capital after the draft, after June 1, all those other things. The reason why you probably make the trade before training camp is because you don't want to risk the, op- the, the, the chance that you're trying to work on a trade with him or, or for him and you get really close and then all of a sudden he gets injured in training camp. And then you're, you know, you're stuck no matter what. And you're like both in a bad position in that case. And then there's absolutely no chance that you're mending the fences at that point. So with that being the case, post June 1, so June 2nd until, you know, June, late June, June 20, whatever, when they open up training camp or July 20, whatever, when they open up training camp, then that gives you sort of your, your range in terms of where you would see that trade end up landing um, if they did do a trade. The, the other thing that's been sort of spun incorrectly pretty often is this idea that Marshall Lattimore is only going to cost $1.2, $1.3 million against the team that's trading for him. That's not entirely true. In fact, that's not true at all. Some portion of that option bonus has to set in no matter what. So you're looking at a $13 million cap hit in 2023, 2024. I keep doing that, sorry. If you trade for Marshall Lattimore or if you're the acquiring team, you can choose to kind of you know, a- approach the option a different way, have it all pay out immediately, take the $15 million cap hit now, and then no guaranteed money in the future gives you an opportunity to be able to, you know, ahead of 2025, look at a new deal and stuff like that. Otherwise, you're just prorating it over the top of a bunch of other numbers that are already there. So the fact of the matter is that no matter what, there's no easy way to trade Marshawn Lattimore. And that's why, or uh, there's no ease when it comes to the pocketbook if you're the team that's acquiring Marshall Lattimore. Let me put it that way. Then you look at other trades that are out there. Jalen Ramsey yielded a third round trade, uh, third round pick. There's a lot of talk about Legereus Sneed, the Kansas City Chiefs cornerback, being tagged and traded for a second round pick. So where does Marshall Lattimore fall in that? Well, apparently, according to some, he falls in the fifth round pick uh, situation, which I could not disagree more with. And by the way, if that's the case, then you don't trade him because again, you don't have to. So you're not going to accept subpar draft capital for a player that you aren't required to move and aren't in a situation that you have to move on from, at least just yet, especially from a salary cap situation. So no, it doesn't seem likely that the Saints would just move Marshall and Lattimore for a fifth round pick. It would be a day two selection, in my opinion, a second round pick or a third round pick. It's not very often that you trade a first round pick for a first round pick, Brandon Cooks excluded several times, apparently. But more than not, more times than not, you're trading for a second or a third round pick with this caliber of player. If the Saints feel that that is something that is worth their while, then sure. But I don't. I don't think it's worth their while. And I don't think that just because they look at it as, hey, this isn't a salary dump, that other teams won't play it as if it is a salary dump and look to undercut the New Orleans Saints in the process. And there's no need to accept less than what you would want for a player that you don't have to move on from. So that's my breakdown. Just to kind of help clear the air, um, Jason over at OTC, Nick over at NOF, folks have done a really good job also covering this as well. So there's a lot of information out there for you know folks that are, are curious about how all of this works. But the Saints are very much not in a situation where they have no choice and they have to move on from Marshall and Lattimore. That's not what this is at all. There's no contract dispute. There's no salary situation. There's nothing like that. Just have to get the relationship where the relationship needs to be. And if they can do that, as they've done before, then they should be okay to continue to move forward. Otherwise, you trade him, but you don't accept less than he is worth if you do that. Coming up next, 
possession wide receiver crawling up the boards for the New Orleans Saints. Where could they find it? The answer is wherever they want to. We got all that coming up for you as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp Therapy Online is absolutely awesome. And the question that I always like to ask is, if you had an extra hour in your day, how would you spend it? The reason why I ask that question is because a lot of times we think about therapy as an opportunity to kind of like diagnose and fix and things like that. But really, like one of the other big things with it is to just sort of reinforce the things that you're doing well. So you had an extra hour in your day, you obviously wouldn't want to spend that time doing something that you don't love. You'd want to spend that time doing something that you're good at, that you do love, and therapy can help you arrive at that conclusion uh, better than really anything else out there. Can. So if you're thinking about therapy, I got to tell you, BetterHelp is the place to give a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Learn to make time for the things that make you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash locked on to get 10% off of your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on. All right, family, there's a chance that the New Orleans Saints need a possession wide receiver has overtaken their need at offensive line. Let's break down why and how they can address it, because they got a lot of options when it comes to that path. We appreciate you very much. As always, make a Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget to go and check out the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 national sports stream, the first of its kind over on YouTube. So go and subscribe on YouTube today. It's Locked On Sports Today for the first ever national sports 24-7 live stream. All right. So the the way that I'm looking at this for the New Orleans Saints is simple. The offensive line outlook has changed drastically since the combine. The wide receiver room outlook has not. So let's explain this. And and because of that, I think that it kind of makes wide receiver, particularly a big body possession wide receiver, a little bit more of a need at this point than offensive line. Now, I think pass rush is still up there, but bear with me. So The reason why I feel better about offensive line is that you learn that Ryan Ramchick doesn't sound like he's in line for any major surgery. He had a minor surgery, according to Dennis Allen, as he told us during the combine. And then Dennis Allen also said that all players are expected to be available to begin training camp with the exception of linebacker Nephi Sewell. So put those two together. Doesn't seem like there's anything standing in the way of Ryan Ramchick as maybe we thought that there would be. And if you pay attention to things at the end of the season, Mickey Loomis was very optimistic about uh, Ryan Ramchick. Uh, Dennis Allen was very optimistic about Ryan Ramchick. And so it seems that things maybe wherever they ended or wherever they got to after the season gave a little bit more clarity than where we expected that they were with two games left in the season when we learned that Ryan Ramchick might be in line for some major offseason surgery. There was even questions about like, will he be able to continue playing football, all of these other things. Well, it seems like a lot of those bigger concerns are now pushed aside. Seems like things have been alleviated. Things are okay where that's going. So that's a big step forward. The other piece is if you're bringing in somebody at left tackle, you're bringing in somebody to compete. You don't have to spend, you know, a ton of money on that. You don't have to even spend a first round pick on that. You can, if you want to, and if the right guy's there, Olu Fashanu out of Penn State, then I think you take that selection at 14. But in terms of free agency, you don't have to go out there and try to book the top guy at left tackle. And then we have to see what happens with Andrews Pete as well. I I personally think Andrews Pete's on his way out the door. I I don't see how you go if you're the New Orleans Saints and bring Andrews Pete back, knowing that you'd have to pay him left tackle money at this point. If the intent is for Trevor Penning to be the starter, unless you do plan to move him inside, but it doesn't sound like that's actually the case. Sounds like that's an option, but it doesn't sound like that's the case, at least right now. Then you could re-sign Andrews Pete, pay him a bunch of left tackle money, which is going to be a lot more expensive than you know interior offensive line money that you've been paying him before. And then put him out at left tackle and then maybe move Trevor Penning inside. But it just doesn't sound like that's the plan. Like just plain and simple. It doesn't sound like that's what's happening. It doesn't seem like people are in a hurry to move Trevor Penning to the inside. They want him to be able to progress as the first round pick at left tackle that he is. So I think in that case, when it comes to offensive linemen, your focus is bringing competition and it's bringing in depth. At wide receiver, you need a starter. Michael Thomas is going to be a free agent like 90%, right? We can't say 100%, but 90%, he's going to be free. It's built into his contract that on the first day of the league year, he he becomes designated as a post-June 1 cut. Expect him to hit the market at the combine. We heard about the Ravens and the Broncos as two potential landing spots for him. So with all of that, 
put together and all of that in mind, you've got three wide receivers on your roster right now. Chris Olave, Rashid Shahid, A.T. Perry. You've got good receivers there, good young receivers. You just revamped your wide receiver coaching staff with a pair of very good wide receiver coaches in Keith Williams, as well as Denarius McGee. And yet you still have a lot more work to get done there because you're not going to walk into training camp with three wide receivers. You're not going to walk into the season with three wide receivers on your roster. This is a team that usually brings in like 12 wide receivers on their roster by the time that they hit training camp between free agency, whether early or late, uh, the draft, and then of course, undrafted free agency. They've usually got over a dozen wide receivers in training camp every year. So they've got like nine guys to add here, right? And the good news is that if you're looking for a possession receiver, you're going to be able to find it, whether it's on the open market or in the NFL draft. A couple of names to watch out for. We know that T Higgins is likely a sign and trade. He would have been the pie in the sky thing. But look, I don't think that the Saints are making a big splash in this year's free agency class. I think that they're going to be waiting around and they'll get into the second wave of free agency as they've done uh, in, in the past, similar to what they did last year, minus Derek Carr. So you look at a guy and said like a Tyler Boyd. You look at the potential for a Hunter Renfro to be moved on from with the Las Vegas Raiders. I'm going to tell you something about the offseason. You're seeing this a lot right now. Um, they talk about there the Panthers up. Uh, you know, there's a report that came out about the Panthers with uh, Dante Jackson, former LSU Tiger, and this idea that they're going to seek a trade before potentially releasing Dante Jackson. They're going to release him. Uh, the reports coming out of Las Vegas have been that they're going to seek a trade before moving on from. Hunter Renfro, they're going to have to move on from. Like the moment that you say like, ah, we're going to release this guy, but we'll look for a trade first. Bye. Like we all know where this is going at this point. Every now and then some team says, okay, we'll give you a seventh just to make sure he ends up on our team. Like every now and then that happens. And by the way, the Saints do have a seventh round pick this year on the trade from Will Lutz. They just don't know yet if it's Denver's original seventh round pick or the seventh round pick they got from San Francisco for Randy Gregory. Hence why we skipped the seventh round pick this past week uh, in our mock draft Monday. Um, but if I had to pick one, it's Dallas Gant, the Toledo linebacker. So there you go. Some land yet. Um, but I do think that the Saints have every pathway available for them to be able to figure out how to add that possession wide receiver because you have those free agents that you can go for. You know, we'll see what happens with Juwan Jennings from San Francisco. The restricted free agent tender is not as cheap as it used to be anymore. John Lynch did say, general manager of the San Francisco 49ers during the combine, that they intend on keeping him in San Francisco, whether it's through that tender or trying to long, land, land, excuse me, a longer term deal, then so I think you can pretty much expect them to at least tender him. But if he hits the market, perfect fit, like good blocker downfield, solid receiver, can clearly throw the football as well. So lots of fun stuff that you could do with a player like that. So there's a couple of free agents or pending free agents slash possible free agents that could potentially come in and help you from that position, among others. But then, oh, and by the way, Lynn Bowden, by the way, speaking of restricted free agents, Lynn Bowden also a restricted free agent, so could be back here in New Orleans in 2024 as well. I've heard he would like that. Uh, the other thing that I look at is the draft. So if you draft at 14, a pass rusher, which feels like the biggest need for New Orleans, depending upon how things go in free agency, draft a pass rusher, then with pick 45, you can go for a, a Xavier Leggett, a, a good, solid receiver. That's maybe not the size that we thought that he was after all of his measurements and everything like that. Came in at six foot one as opposed to six foot three, but hey, here we are. Uh, still a dang good player that plays much bigger than he is. And he's coming out of University of South Carolina. He could be one of those guys. Uh, you could potentially draft a wide receiver at 14 and feel pretty good about it if you address pass rusher adequately in free agency. You could trade back up into the first round if you want to get really aggressive, get your pass rusher at 14, trade up into the back end of the draft, excuse me, trade up into the back end of the first round of the draft, and then maybe add a possession receiver then. There's tons of options. You can go with a Rosemead Jackson uh, later on in the, in the draft coming out of, uh, coming out of uh, uh, Georgia and still get a good, solid possession receiver. A Luke McCaffrey, good, solid possession receiver. Like There's a lot of these guys in this year's draft. And oh, by the way, A.T. Perry could potentially hold down that role as well. But of course, you want to bring in the competition to continue to develop the young player. Competition helps the development. And I promise you, with the way that this, this position group is about to be coached, there's going to be a lot of competition when it comes to wide receivers. So position wide receiver, I think, shooting up the boards for the New Orleans Saints when it comes to need, especially as offensive line begins to trickle down. 
And honestly, that could be good news for you uh, for the New Orleans Saints because you probably have a lot more accessible options to address your wide receiver group long term than you have offensive tackle, offensive line long term at the moment anyway. So not a bad situation to be in. All right, coming up next, let's update you on the players that the Saints most notably met uh, over at the Combine in Indianapolis. We got that coming up for you as we continue on and wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by friends at FanDuel. Make every moment more with America's number one sports book. Of course, you can shoot your shot right now with all the great stuff going on around the NBA. The Boston Celtics are absolutely on a heater right now over in the Eastern Conference. You got the New Orleans Pelicans who are looking to seal a playoff spot as well. There's so much for you to check out, including some uh, quick bets, some live same game parlays, exclusive props, and much more over at FanDuel. And right now, new customers can get $150 back by just winning your first $5 bet. That's it. $150 bucks to you if that first $5 bet wins. So go and pick a heavy favorite somewhere for your first bet. Put $5 down. Enjoy the, the little bit of winnings that you'll get from that specific wager. But then $150 in bonus bets coming your way. It doesn't get any better than FanDuel, to put it simply. Go and check them out today. FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Let's get it, Houdat Nation. The New Orleans Saints were busy meeting with a lot of prospects at the NFL Combine in Indianapolis. And even though they meet with just about every player at these games, like the Senior Bowl, the East West Shrine game, um, you know, a little bit of that is the Combine as well. There are some notable visits that take place. So I just wanted to kind of run down the list, let you know how each of these players could potentially fit for the New Orleans Saints in the 2024 NFL Draft. Appreciate you as always for being here. Don't forget, we are your team every day, so we'll be back here with you tomorrow for a fresh episode of Locked on Saints. Don't miss out. We're still five days a week. We don't stop. There's no off-season for us here on Locked on, and I don't take vacations, so let's get it. <laughs> let's get it. We got a long off-season and a busy and a fun off-season away. I'm not missing a beat. We're not missing a beat. So uh, let's take a look at Four quarterbacks that the New Orleans Saints visited with at the NFL Combine. We'll start off with Jaden Daniels. We'll take a look at J.J. McCarthy, the quarterback out of Michigan. Drake May, the quarterback out of University of North Carolina. And of course, Bo Nix, the QB out of Oregon. So all four of those quarterbacks met with the New Orleans Saints at the Combine, according to various reports. Um, Jaden Daniels is also one that my good friend John Hendricks from over at Saints News Network and Second and Saints, another show that you could be checking out, a weekly show. Uh, it's a little bit longer form, a little bit more conversational, things like that. Um, that they had actually met with Jaden Daniels previously as well, which makes a ton of sense. They would have met with him at the Senior Bowl and, and things like that. So no real surprise there, but he did have a formal visit with the New Orleans Saints. Does this mean that the New Orleans Saints are going to shock the world and trade up to two and try to you know draft Jaden Daniels or trade up to three and try to draft Jaden Daniels uh, in the top five, top three? No, it, it, it very much doesn't. Um, I don't expect any of these four quarterbacks to be drafted by the New Orleans Saints is just an opportunity for you to be able to kind of learn a little bit about these players so that in four or five years, if they become available, hey, you've got a historical document, as Jeff Ireland calls it, uh, that you can that you can look at. And then otherwise, if one of them happens to be there at 14 that you really, really like, like a Jaden Daniels, for whatever reason, suspiciously falls to 14, and even Jeff Ireland himself was like, that's not happening. Uh, but you want to be prepared, right? You want to at least have information so that you can make the most educated decision. If you're going to say no at 14 to a quarterback like a Drake May or a Jaden Daniels, you better have a good reason why. And that's what this sort of like historical like relevance, doing your due diligence, all these other things ends up making, uh, ends up having an impact on. So does it signify the Saints are in the market for a quarterback in this year's NFL draft in the first round? No, it, it really, really doesn't. But it does give you an opportunity to be ready and be able to make a decision based upon what you know about the player as opposed to what you don't know about the player. Like you want to be able to say, OK, let's say that Jared Verse is the best player on the board at 14, best non-quarterback on the board at 14, and the best quarterback on the board at 14 is who's rising? J.J. McCarthy. He's shooting up boards right now. So let's say that both of them are there at 14. You, as the New Orleans Saints, need to have information on both J.J. McCarthy and on Jared Verse so that you can make that decision. You don't want to be in a situation where you have a bunch of information on Jared Verse, nothing on J.J. McCarthy, and then turn around and go, uh, quarterback, position value, draft, and then select the quarterback that ends up not being a fit for you that you end up not liking because you didn't do the front work or anything like that. Or 
The other side of it is that you don't want to say no to JJ McCarthy simply because you don't have any information on him. You'd rather have the information. So make it an educated no, not just any no. So again, I don't expect the New Orleans Saints are all of a sudden in the quarterback market in this year's NFL draft, but certainly they're going to do their due diligence on the way. A um, couple of safeties that the Saints also met with at the combine or have met with over you know the course of the, the past, you know all the different things. Uh, Mark Perry out of TCU, uh, Trey Taylor, who we talked about out of Air Force. But then at the Combine, they met with Jaden Hicks, the safety out of Washington, as well as Kalen Bullock, the safety out of USC. Both these guys are um, really interesting players. They're big, like bigger safety. So you could see their ability to be able to come down and play in the box and kind of be you know, a wrecking machine down there, but also can drop back into coverage. So it's kind of a, like they're also really good options to replace a Marcus May, for instance, like if you're going to end up doing like you did at the end of the season. So Jonathan Abram, when he played in Marcus May's place next to Tyron Matthew over the course of the last two games of the season, he was like 20% drop back, 20% playing in the box, 20% lining up, you know, or, or 20% like dropping into the flats, things like that. So he was really evenly split in terms of how he was deployed and moved around amongst the various safety responsibilities, which range from playing deep, rushing the passer, being a run stopper down in the box, playing in the slot, and then manning the flats, and then manning the middle of the field, like short middle, like a whole bunch of stuff you got to be able to do as a safety. And he was kind of asked to do versions of that all very equally, 20%, 20%, 20%, and then everything else was kind of spread out from there. Each of these guys, Jordan Hicks, as well as Kalen Bullock, could do that, right? Guys that you could put deep, that you can put down in the box and that you could move around quite a bit. That's obviously something that the New Orleans Saints very much value at the safety position. Remember when they brought in um, both Marcus May and uh, Tyron Matthew, one of the big things that Dennis Allen highlighted was sort of the, the versatility and the ability to be able to disguise and bluff and do, you know, start these guys in one place and move them around, swap them, change them on a play-to-play -play basis, all these other things, swap their responsibilities. Uh, you didn't get to fully realize that because you only got Marcus May for 17 games over the course of those two seasons, literally half of what he should have been available for or could have been available for. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the Saints are expected to move on from him when the new league year begins. And guys like Kalen Bullock, as well as, of course, uh, Jaden Hicks could potentially be options there. Now, there were also some reports that Cooper DeGene, the defensive back who is incredibly versatile coming out of Iowa, could potentially be, or, or also met with the Saints at the Combine as well. I haven't been able to confirm that, but it is something that makes sense, right? You see the, the, the versatility of, uh, uh, of a uh, Mark uh, Perry who can play in the slot and play in the box. You see the versatility of a Trey Taylor who can play in the box and play deep. Uh, guys like who we just talked about and Kalen Bullock as well as Jaden Hicks can play in the box, can play deep. Caden Bullock can play a little bit in the slot as well. And then you look at a guy like Cooper DeGene who can just yes. Uh, over all of it. Yes. Right. Like he can do all of it, but he also might be the first defensive player off the board for all we know in this year's, uh, in this year's draft. So he might be a guy that's just a little bit out of spitting distance. But again, if you're going to stay at 14 and Cooper DeGene ends up falling all the way down, you want to have the information upon which you can base a yes or a no. You don't want to be in a situation to where a guy that spectacular ends up falling all the way down to you at 14 and then you're not ready. Think about Pat, think about Marshawn Lattimore just a few years ago, right? In 2017. That's not just a few years ago anymore, is it? No, it's not. Yikes. But anyway, you get the idea there. Uh, Saints also met with another versatile safety, Malik Mustafa. There's a theme here coming out of Wake Forest. Again, guy that could play down in the box. Probably, probably a little bit more Jonathan Abramsy. Like you want to see him more down in the box, things like that. He's kind of just a big old safety. He's like a big old dime linebacker. Like he's just one of those types of dudes. Big old dude that can absolutely you know cause some trouble for you or in a good way, right? Cause some trouble, help to cause some trouble with your defense. And so he's a guy that is usually kind of trending around sort of those fifth round compensatory picks and stuff like that. So not a big move that you would have to make to be able to land a guy like Malik Mustafa, who is a, a pretty talented player. And then finally, um, Jatavion Sanders, the tight end out of Texas, um, really versatile player. Uh, I think, you know, uh, Corey, Corey Moses is a, is a good friend from over at uh, KVU over in Austin has covered Jatavion talked about how like the gap between him and Brock Bowers isn't as big as people think and stuff like that. Those are big statements, but look, he's generated a lot of excitement and could be another one of those very athletic playmaker E tight ends that could be a solid pick at 45 for the Saints in the second round if they want to add a big bodied 
uh, athletic pass catcher that early, which, hey, if you don't find that big bodied player at wide receiver in the draft, then maybe at tight end is a place for you to go. So think of him as like an earlier drafted Theo Johnson, for instance, a guy that I've continued to tout here on the podcast out of Penn State. So uh, those are the uh, combine visits that are of note. There are obviously more, but those are the ones that are really of note to me that you should obviously be keeping an eye out on. Um, Braylon Trice, uh, the edge out of Washington's another one to watch out for, very prototypical size, all those other things. So there's some other players out there for sure, but these are the ones that I thought were most notable in terms of the Saints' biggest needs and biggest storylines. Coming up uh, tomorrow, we got a fresh episode for you here on Locked on Saints. We appreciate you very much making it your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget to come through also for Locked on Pels with Jake Madison and Locked on LSU with Caroline Fenton. Thank you very much as always, making Locked on Saints a part of your day, part of your routine for saying yes to me and the show. As always, if you see me, please say hi. And if you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on your favorite social media at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're moming them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.